Dinosaurs are so terrible at working on bikes. Anyways, I was trying to pop a wheelie the other day and instead of getting the front wheel in the air, it went more like this. After coming to the sad realization the chain was skipping teeth, I quickly checked the slack and it was loose but still technically in spec. The rear sprocket appeared to be okay but the front sprocket looked like a train wreck. Not much longer and that sprocket would have been converted into a belt pulley. The front sprocket is definitely easy to overlook since it's usually hiding in its cave. And it makes sense it would wear out quicker than the bigger rear sprocket since it's spinning faster and each tooth is contacting the chain more often. I did originally install a smaller rear sprocket with less than 100 miles on the bike, but if the bike isn't new it's usually best to replace both sprockets and chain all at once. The TW200 comes from the factory with a 14 tooth sprocket on the front and a 50 tooth on the rear. The reason the sprockets are different sizes is that it provides a mechanical advantage. When the front sprocket gets bigger, the potential speed of the bike is increased. But there is a trade off and that's going to be an equal decrease in torque. When you use a smaller sized front sprocket you have the opposite effect. Torque goes up and speed goes down. Then we look at the rear sprocket which creates the reverse effect. Bigger sprocket causes torque to go up and speed to go down while a smaller sprocket makes torque go down and speed go up. Typically extra torque is better for off road riding while more speed is useful for road riding. However, your final drive speed is still limited to the output of the engine, which is not very much on the TW200. Choosing the right sprocket combo to fit your riding style can get a little complicated, so I like to use sprocketcalculator.com. Under current, I'll enter 14 front, 50 rear, and 122 links for the stock setup. Under new, I'll add my first sprocket change where I replace the rear with a 47. This gave me a 6.4% increase in speed with an equal decrease in torque when compared to stock. It's also nice how this calculator tells you how many chain links are needed for the new setup, but I didn't need to break any of the links off when adding the 47 rear sprocket. It just placed it in about the middle of the snail adjusters. After riding over 13,000 miles on this setup, it's safe to say it was a great mix between on and off road. It kept the engine a little more calm at 55 miles an hour while still keeping it fully capable on gnarly off-road trails. For my new setup I'll be installing a new 15 front and 50 rear. This will give me a 7.1% change from stock which is only a 0.7% difference from my last setup. I probably won't even notice a difference. As a heads up if your bike is new and you're contemplating whether you should replace the front or rear sprocket go with the rear because it's easier to change. Also if you're replacing Placing the chain, make sure you order one that has the same or more amount of links according to the calculator. Before we get started, I recommend wearing some rubber gloves and safety glasses because we will be working with oil and grease and you never know when something could fly into your eye when working on the bike. Also as a disclaimer, if you don't feel 100% comfortable working on your bike, I would highly recommend taking it to a shop. Remember you are solely responsible for your own actions. It's also not a bad idea to wash your bike beforehand, especially if you plan on replacing the front sprocket. To start out, use an 8mm to remove the two bolts for the chain cover and it just slides off. With the bike in neutral, push it until the chain master link is in a good spot to access. I just used a pair of needle nose pliers to pop the clip forward so when the big part in the center lines up with the pin, it slides right off along with the outer link. Then the master link should slide right out. And as long as your bike is in neutral, the chain should slide right off. Next I'll remove my aftermarket skid plate using a Torx 40 to loosen the two bolts on the rear, but you might not have to remove them all the way. Then use a 13mm to remove the two bolts on the front and the skid plate will swing down and out to the front. If you still have the stock skid plate, just remove the 10mm bolt on the front and it just swings down and unclips from the rear. Next, grab 
grab a 10 millimeter and remove the bolt for the shifter and it should slide right off but it might require some wiggling. Next with the catch container below I'll use a 19 millimeter and remove the drain plug along with the spring and strainer. While it's draining I'll use a 17 millimeter to unbolt the left foot peg assembly and how convenient it's already loose. Once the oil is drained, go ahead and line up the drain plug, spring, and strainer, then thread it back on and torque it down to 43 newton meters. It's also not a bad idea to leave yourself a reminder to fill the oil just in case. Next, you will want to make sure it's as clean as possible around where the case and side cover meet to prevent any dirt from falling in. Use an 8mm to remove all 10 bolts that are located here. Once you got the bolts removed, go ahead and slide off the cover and you might need to wiggle it a little bit because the dowel pins and the shafts need to be slid off with it. There will be two wires attached to the side cover that are for the stator and pickup coil. The plugs for them are further up and underneath the seat in case you want to remove it all the way. But for this job, I'll just rest it on top of a box. As you can tell, there is quite a lot of dirt and grease that needs to be cleaned up. For all the dirt packed into the wire cavity, I'll use a plastic trim tool to scrape it loose while at the same time I'll use a shop back to suck it out so it doesn't end up falling into the engine. Next, I'll flip the side cover somewhat upside down and remove the old gasket and any loose dirt along with it. Once again, I'll use the plastic scraper and and shop back to remove as much dirt as possible Greasy dirt gets built up really thick around where the front sprocket is. I'll eventually break out some solvent and paper towels to really clean things up on the side cover and engine, but try not to get any solvents or cleaners directly on the seals. While cleaning, I used part of a paper towel to plug the bearing hole on the side cover to prevent dirt from falling in. When done, I'll use a paper towel to remove any dirt that may have accidentally fell into the engine, and clean any dirt on the side cover shaft bearing seal. This is also a good time to replace any leaking seals but try not to mistake a leaking seal for chain grease. Another good thing to check is the chain slider. Mine looks okay but if you need to replace it you will have to remove the swing arm. There's also a small chain slider that slides into the side cover. Next, temporarily slide the shifter on and place it into gear. Use an 8mm to remove the two bolts for the sprocket. Twist the lock so the teeth align and it just slides right Right off. I got a new 15 tooth front sprocket that is made with chrome molly steel on ProCycle.com. And here is the old compared to the new. It definitely needed to be replaced. Go ahead and slide the new sprocket on followed by the locking ring and twist it in that groove until the two holes line up with the threaded ones on the sprocket. I'll use a drop of blue Loctite on each bolt for extra insurance. Thread them in by hand and use a quarter inch torque wrench to torque them down to 4 newton meters. It is normal for the sprocket to wiggle slightly on the shaft since it is not bolted directly to it. There is a shaft and spacer for the starter gear that may have come off with the side cover. I'll just remove it, coat it in some fresh oil and slide it back into the gear to make reassembly a little easier. I'll look for any specks of dirt or debris that may have found its way into the engine and remove it with a clean paper towel. This is also a good time to put a little bit of clean oil on the side cover bearing seal and output shaft so it slides together easily. Also check the bearing by making sure it turns smoothly with a finger, but it's unlikely this bearing will wear out quickly since it gets lubrication from the engine. Then make sure the sealing surfaces on the engine and side cover are completely clean. The service manual doesn't say anything about it but there appears to have been some RTV on the wire inserts. I'll just remove the tops of the old RTV that was sticking up and apply a very small bead of fresh RTV across both plugs, but you don't need very much. Next I'll grab the new gasket and line it up over the side cover and slide it over the two dowel pins and around the wires. If one or both dowel pins are missing they may still be on the engine or they fell onto the ground. Also keep in mind the one on the top appears to be slightly longer. Now go ahead and line up everything and slide the side cover on. Make sure the wires fit through the opening on the engine and are not pinched in any way. The side cover should be sitting flush against the engine all the way around. Then I'll thread all the bolts in by hand. Keep in mind that two bolts are longer than the rest and they go where the dowel pins are which are located here. I'll just snug up the bolts slightly in a crisscross pattern starting in the middle. Then I'll use a quarter inch torque 
wrench to torque them down to 7 newton meters in that same crisscross pattern. When I'm done, I like to go back through and recheck them just to make sure I didn't miss any. Then of course, don't forget to fill it back up with oil, and it's also good to wait about 24 hours before starting so the RTV can fully cure. There used to be a zip tie holding the wires on to the frame, so I'll just install a new one. Next, I'll reinstall the shift lever and torque it down to 10 newton meters. I put some Loctite on the bolt for the foot peg bracket, thread it on, and torqued it down to 60 newton meters. I'll reinstall the skid plate by sliding the rear brackets over the frame, bolt down the front, then tighten down the rear. Alright, now let's replace the rear sprocket which will be a bit easier. Start by disconnecting the rear brake shaft by removing the wing nut and pulling back on the brake lever to remove the shaft. I'll slide out the pivot pin and spring so I don't lose them. I'll use a crescent wrench to hold the axle bolt in place while I loosen the nut with a 22 millimeter. Then I'll use my bike lift to get the rear wheel off the ground. I'll remove the nut, a washer, and the snail adjuster. Then slide the axle bolt all the way out along with the other snail adjuster. Next I'll remove the spacer and the brake shoe assembly. This is also a great time to inspect the brake shoes for wear or any damage. I'll just set the tire on top of this trash can with the sprocket facing up so it's easier to work on. Next I'll use a small flathead and hammer to push back the lock washer tabs, then use a big flathead screwdriver to finish pulling them back. Use a 13mm box end wrench to hold the nut on the bottom while breaking it free with a 13mm socket on top, and unbolt it. Keep in mind there is a regular washer under the nut. Then remove all of them along with the lock washers and the sprocket will come right off. I'll go ahead and clean off any dirt on the wheel hub where the sprocket sits. So I bought this new 50 tooth rear sprocket on ProCycle.com and if you look on there you will also see they sell a bolt kit which I got back when I changed to the 47. The bolt kit is necessary for aftermarket sprockets where the middle part is thinner and recessed compared to the stock sprocket where it's the same thickness throughout the whole thing. Here is a side by side comparison showing the stock bolt not having as many threads. Once installed you can see the nut would not be able to tighten down all the way on the stock bolt even with the washer. You could however simply just add an extra washer to make the stock bolts work. The bolt kit also comes with new lock washers, lock nuts, and regular washers. I also bought new lock washers since the manual says to replace them every time because they are likely to rip when unbending them. After making sure I line the new sprocket up with the proper holes, I'll drop in the 6 bolts and 3 lock washers. It's nice that this sprocket has more room for the lock washer tabs compared to the last one. Next I'll install a washer and thread a lock nut onto each bolt. Then I'll use the same 13 millimeters to thread on and snug up the bolts in a crisscross pattern. The manual says to put Loctite on these bolts but I honestly forgot. However, the lock nuts should be enough since they do not spin freely on the threads. Once they are snug I'll torque them down to 35 newton meters in the same crisscross pattern while still keeping the nuts from spinning with the wrench. Next I'll slightly spin them in the tightening direction until the flats of the bolt heads line up with the lock washer tabs. I put some electrical tape around the big flathead screwdriver to help protect the finish of the sprocket, and then I bent the lock washer tabs up against the bolt head flats. Then I used some channel lock pliers to finish the job, and you only need to bend one tab per bolt. Now that the new sprocket is on, this is a great time to check the wheel bearings, just make sure they spin smoothly and are not loose. Mine seem to be okay. Next I'll install the brake assembly and spacer, then slide the wheel on the swing arm, making sure everything lines up including the groove on the brake assembly. Next I'll slide in the axle and the left snail adjuster all the way through and install the right snail adjuster, washer, and bolt and take the bike off the lift. Go ahead and set the adjusters to the lowest setting and snug up the axle nut but don't torque it down just yet. Then I'll connect the brake shaft in reverse order and finally it's time to install the chain and I will be using this DID X-ring chain instead of the regular RK chain I had laying around. One important thing to look at when getting a chain is the size. It's a number usually between 400 and 600 on motorcycles. The TW 200 uses a 420 
28 size chain and this just means it has a pitch of one half of an inch between the center of the pins and an inner width of 5 sixteenths of an inch. The next number to look for is the amount of links it has. This is usually around the 100 range and like I said earlier the stock TW200 comes with a 122 link chain but the calculator said my new setup will need 125 links. So this RK regular chain most likely won't even fit. The X-ring chain I got has 126 six links because it only came in 124 or 126. You can always remove links but you can't exactly add more on so when in doubt always get the one with more links. Inside is the chain itself that comes pre-lubed, then there is a bag that contains the master link along with four x-rings and a small thing of lubricant. An x-ring chain is basically an o-ring chain except they were cut into an x pattern. So basically an o-ring chain or sometimes called a sealed chain uses o-rings to seal the pivot point between the roller link and the pin link. So grease put inside there from the factory will stay there and dirt and water will stay out. This makes the chain last much longer and requires a lot less maintenance, especially in dirty conditions. However, it creates more resistance when compared to a clean, well lubricated regular chain. But a dirty regular chain is more likely causing even more resistance than a dirty sealed chain. The benefit of an X-ring is that it creates less resistance and allows slightly more room for grease to be stored. The only downside is that they typically cost more than a normal O-ring chain. Alright, to install the chain make sure the bike is in neutral and slide the chain over the front sprocket and as you spin it with your finger grab the chain and feed it out the bottom. Then pull it through making sure it goes over the frame and back to the rear sprocket. Lay the top part over the sprocket and pull the lower part as tight as it will go while still being able to mesh it with the teeth. I'll temporarily zip tie both sides of the chain to the sprocket and I'll check the chain slack on the bottom with a tape measure by pushing down as far as it will go and then pushing it up. As long as it's above 30 millimeters with the snail adjusters at the lowest setting we can remove two links. The 124 link chain would have been perfect actually but better safe than sorry. I'll use a sharpie to mark the link that needs to be broken and install the zip tie for further down so I have some room to work. I'll clamp on the chain breaker over one of the pins and start to turn the handle. It does get pretty hard to turn, but once you start breaking through one pin, switch to the other side and go back and forth. A lot of people recommend you grind down the riveted tops of the pins before you push them out because you're less likely to break the tool. In fact, you should be able to remove the links with grinding or cutting alone, but if you go this route, be careful not to accidentally damage the rest of the the chain. So that worked pretty well, it just slides right off along with the X-rings. Now the chain ends will line up. To install the master link I'll slide an X-ring on each pin, then squeeze the packet of grease on the pins and in the empty holes on the chain. Slide in the link and add another X-ring on each pin. I slid the outer part on and it appears to be press fit, so I used a small C-clamp to press it all the way on until the grooves show. Place the master link on and snap it in with some pliers and it did take me a few tries. Make sure it's completely on and sitting in the grooves. Also make sure the closed end of the clip is pointing in the same direction the chain moves. This is to prevent it from unclipping in case the chain were to rub up against a rock or something. Next I'll loosen the axle nut up some and move the snail adjusters evenly until the chain slack is within 30 to 60 millimeters. Mine is right at 30. While holding the axle bolt with a crescent wrench, I'll torque the nut down to 90 newton meters. After that, it's a good idea to make sure the snail adjusters are on the same slot and the chain slack is still the same. Next, I'll install the chain cover, making sure the rear slides on correctly, then bolt it down. Then I'll spin the rear brake adjuster wing nut until the brake pedal free play is between 20 and 30 millimeters. Turning it in decreases free play and turning it out increases it and we're finally all done all right now it's time to try it out and so far I don't really notice a difference between the old uh, 1447 versus the new 1550 Woo! so slippery ah. one thing I will mention is that it does not seem to make as much noise like on the old chain it seemed to be like a little more clickety clackety in the rear Especially at like higher speeds, but this doesn't seem to do that, which is pretty cool. And so 
far, I haven't noticed any difference in horsepower. I mean, if the X-ring chain does rob a little bit of power, it's not anything to worry about, it seems like. I can still cruise at 55 or 60 miles an hour, so that's good. Then, of course, after a few rides, it's probably not a bad idea to recheck the chain slack, just in case it needs to get broken in and it stretches a little bit. All right, I'm gonna hit this futon real quick. Woo. Well, anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this video and you got a lot of value out of it. Let me know what you thought of it in the comments below. And I'm also sorry this video took so long to get done. Uh, I had to like order some parts like halfway through. And it was just uh, quite an involved video. But the next two videos will be a two night moto camping trip. So that should be pretty sweet. And I'm also pretty sure I'm going to Moab this March. So I'll definitely be making a video about that. And of course, if you wanna see more TW200 how-to videos, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And I will catch you guys next time. Peace.